Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us uh, for the second part of our Constitution Week celebrations. You know, uh, every university that receives funding uh, from uh, the federal government is required by Congress to have some event commemorating our Constitution. This is the Hallenstein Center's third annual Constitution Day celebration. We're very proud to bring it to you. We've always had a very exciting program, and this year is no different. Uh, if you were with us yesterday, you saw none other than James Madison himself, all five feet four of him, uh, regale us on the origins of the Constitution and then what it was like to be Secretary of State. Today we have a little bit different twist. We have a speaker now who is an eminent scholar who understands the founders and the, the context in which James Madison worked. Let me tell you a little bit about Dr. George Nash. He's an independent scholar uh, living in South Hadley, Massachusetts. And he's really a, a fine presidential historian. He has written on Coolidge, Hoover, Franklin Roosevelt, and Reagan, and he gives very engaging talks on each of these. In fact, when he was working uh, on his Hoover volumes, I've got to tell you, that this shows the commitment that some scholars have to their subject. And uh, Dr. Nash is from Massachusetts. He lived for 20 years of his life in Iowa, putting up even with Iowa winters, except January's. He assures me that in January, he would always go back to where they had better winters in Massachusetts. But he was putting up with Iowa winters for 20 years while he wrote three magisterial volumes that are the definitive history of Herbert Hoover and also completed a fourth volume. So I would refer you, if ever you're doing any work on Herbert Hoover, to uh, George Nash's work. He is the most eminent authority on this earth, on Hoover. Uh, because of his work on Hoover, we've had, uh, and, and the other presidents, we've had uh, Dr. Nash in several, on several occasions, and we were so impressed with his performance, we made him a Hallenstein Center associate. And um, he's also an associate of the Russell Kirk Center, which is in Macosta, Michigan, north of here. He is uh, in Macosta this week, uh, this weekend, to uh, hold some seminars up there. Because you may have heard of other work that uh, Dr. Nash has completed, uh, specifically the conservative intellectual movement in America since 1945, a book that is authoritative. It is the foundational text in its field. It's in its third edition, and it really is the starting point if you're trying to come to grips with what conservatism looked like in America uh, after 1945. And this explains his association as a, a fellow and a scholar at the Russell Kirk Center. By the way, uh, the president of the Russell Kirk Center is with us today, Annette Kirk. Uh, can you please just indicate? Yes, thank you for joining us today. Uh, also, I want to point out that um, George Nash is working on a book right now on, on Herbert Hoover, but with a twist. It's on the complex personal and political relationship between Hoover and FDR. Fascinating topic, and I got to talk to George about this uh, after lunch, and it really is, I, I think this is going to be a book that's going to explain a lot of the tension in 20th century political life. And um, his, his talks on, on Hoover are just fascinating. One fact that I always like to tell audiences, if you've heard me talk about uh, other topics, um, specifically on Hoover, you've heard me say one fact that I've always carried with me based on what George Nash has taught. It's that Herbert Hoover is responsible through the systems he set up uh, for feeding more people than any other else, anybody else who's ever walked this earth. More than 80 million people. It's a, one of those shock, those wow facts that uh, I like to spread. Well, because George is from Massachusetts. Uh, he and his mother raised him to believe that Massachusetts has more history than any other state in the United States, including Virginia. I don't know what Mr. Madison would have thought about that last, last night, but he uh, steeped himself very, very early in the history of the founding of this country. And from 1987 to 1990, as a scholar, he served by a presidential appointment on the National Commission on Libraries and Information Science. And while he was uh, serving on that commission, he developed a lecture, a talk, called Books and the Founding Fathers. It was published by the Library of Congress in 1987. And that is a topic that Dr. Nash has loved. He keeps coming back to it. And we're going to get a, an iteration of it today as it continues to evolve. And I'm very happy to present to you 
Dr. George Nash. Thank you very much, Leaves, and good afternoon, everyone. Very gracious introduction, and I very much enjoy the opportunity to revisit Grand Valley State University and to renew in person my association of some time now with the Hohenstein Center. I think this is about the third occasion that I can recall that they start to blend after a while, and they've always been pleasant, and it is a pleasure once again to, to be on your campus. As uh, Gleaves Whitney mentioned in his introduction, much of my scholarship and writing has focused on 20th century presidents and on the conservative intellectual movement in America in recent decades. But from time to time, I enjoy revisiting another love of mine, namely the founding period, the American Revolution and its aftermath. Uh, it goes back, as Gleaves suggested, to uh, boyhood influences, I suppose, but also to uh, the graduate school influence of one of my professors at Harvard, uh, Bernard Balin, whom many of you may recognize, and perhaps you've read some of his works. And his seminar in colonial and revolutionary war history, which I took in my first year of graduate school some time back, was, I think, a formative influence on me, even though I have not developed it as extensively as, my, as I have with uh, more recent uh, periods of American history. Uh, so, although most of my scholarly interest has been in the 20th century on an active daily basis, if you will, uh, I'm going to have the fun this afternoon, and I hope you will join me in that, of uh, skipping back a couple hundred years and looking at the Founding Fathers. I wonder how many people in this audience know the origin of the phrase Founding Fathers. It seems that the person who coined this term was Warren Harding, President of the United States in the early 1920s. In a speech on George Washington's birthday in 1918, Harding, at that time a senator from Ohio, mentioned what he called the fountains of wisdom inherited from the founding fathers of the republic. Three years later, in his inaugural address as president, Harding declared, I must utter my belief in the divine inspiration of the founding fathers. There's the phrase. Although no one, I suspect, would place Harding himself in the intellectual company of the framers of the Constitution, few Americans would contest the sentiments that prompted his felicitous phrase-making. Indeed, the, honor, the impulse to honor the founders of our republic and learn more about them has intensified in our own time. In the past generation, as we have celebrated the bicentennial first of our independence and then of the Constitution and Bill of Rights, we have been treated to a veritable feast of books assessing the achievement of the revolutionary generation. Every year, new volumes appear, narrating, interpreting, and documenting the process by which the founders and their contemporaries created a regime of ordered liberty unique in all history. In just the past five years or so, Monumental biographies of Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, and Alexander Hamilton have made the national bestseller lists, along with new studies of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. In my lecture today, I shall not tread directly over that familiar ground. Instead, I propose to explore a theme that has received less attention, namely some of the ways in which the written word and specifically books and libraries, have molded the remarkable elite that made and preserved the American Revolution. The first op uh, observation that comes forcibly to mind is that the great majority of the Founding Fathers were, in fact, readers. And here I may just digress for a moment to explain that when I use the term founders or founding fathers, I'm not referring narrowly to the 55 men who convened in Philadelphia in 1787, but also to their leading contemporaries, such as John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, John Jay, and Patrick Henry, who did not attend the Constitutional Convention, but who obviously shaped the larger founding era. So I'm using the term in a somewhat broader sense. And again, I return to that first observation, that that group of people, the great majority of them, these founders, were, in fact, readers. 